I'd like to thank Adrian for coming along to give our first talk. So uh, Adrian's very much been interested in the issue of uh, utilizing the idea of prediction, mar uh, prediction markets, but within a machine learning context, uh, and uh, set up one of the kind of first papers looking at uh, uh, the issue of how do we actually uh, deal with uh, prediction markets for uh, specifically for dealing with standard machine learning problems that maybe we bump into uh, on a daily basis uh, in a machine learning context. Uh, so he's come to talk about the artificial prediction market. Thank you, Amos, for inviting me here. It's great to be here. Uh, does everybody hear me? Okay. So this is work we started in 2008 when I got excited about the real prediction markets. And uh, let me show you where we are now. So uh, we presented uh, an initial version of this work in ICML 2010. And since then, we did this further work along. Uh, we found out what the loss function of our prediction market is, at least in some cases. So we know what function uh, the prediction market is optimizing. And it's good news that it's optimizing the KL divergence to the true distribution. So that's good. And we found relations to other existing methods to linear aggregation. We know that. Uh, also to kernel methods, not exactly SVN, just kernel methods uh, and to logistic regression. And then we extended it to uh, regression. So we predict, instead of predicting a probability over the classes, we predict a probability over the real numbers, or even over 2D, and so on. And we also uh, applied it to a lymph node detection problem and compared with AWS. So let me set you up in, uh, in the framework that we're going to work in. So we we'll, Initially, we want to do classification. So we have an instance space in some high dimensional feature space. Let's say this is omega. And we have k possible classes. And we would like to train a classifier, which is this function f. Um, which will give us the probability over the classes. And we are given training examples x i y i telling us what the correct class is for some x's from the instance space omega. Um, and we would like to do that with an imitation of the uh, prediction market. And we will uh, mimic the Iowa electronic market, uh, which was observed uh, to predict and to have these, um, the prices for the different contracts to approximate the probability of the outcome. And the setup for the Iowa electronic market is like this. You have contracts for each possible outcome, so for each class. For example, here we have four classes in this example of the uh, Democratic Convention in 2008. Um, and each contract pays one if the outcome is realized. So. If you bought a contract that Obama wins the Democratic Convention, then you're going to get $1, uh, let's say, in November. Um, and the, the market, so the, the contracts are bought and sold at market price. And because of that, the market price represents the, an approximation of the probability of the event. So we would like to, to, to simulate this Iowa electronic market uh, on the computer where the market participants are classifiers. So each market participant basically will try to predict these classes. So it will, will be like a, a small function h. Um, and in our market setup, we don't consider the time. We will find some equations which um, which tell us what, I mean, what the price should be so that all the money from the, um, from the betting 
is given to the winners and everybody's happy uh, and no money is made and no money is lost in this process. And so we, we will solve these uh, equations either analytically or numerically and then we can do this very quickly and because of that we can uh, apply it to many instances and get the probabilities for, for all these instances and then uh, apply it to like lymph node detection. Um, and the market will be trained with training examples. So after we find these price equations, actually I have here uh, this diagram. So these are the participants in the prediction market and with the equilibrium plans, which is obtained from these equations that I'm going to show you, uh, so we can compute the, this price. Then, so that's given any x, any input x. Each classifier has his own belief of what's going to happen, and you get the equilibrium price. Uh, and then if you have a y, you, you feed that, based on that y, you update the budgets of each of these participants, and then the participants that were able to predict well, they will get rich and the others will get poor. And that's how we train the market. And then we will see that this trained market predicts better than the initial market, the untrained one. And we will see that that's because of this uh, maximum likelihood. Um, there are other prediction markets, and I only list the ones that I know, and probably there are others that I don't know of. The, the first one that I heard of was of Perol in, Perols in 2009, um, which was based on perimutual betting, which is used in horse races. And the, usually the perimutual betting has these odds, so like each there are odds for each possible outcome, like this is 10 to 1, this is 5 to 1. Um, but he devised an odds update because these odds are not known beforehand. So then there's a mechanism to uh, update the odds. He presents that. Uh, but the participants are not trained. So you just, everybody has the same budget. And he evaluates the prediction, his prediction market on some UCI data sets. And then uh, Chen and Wogan and uh, Abernethy and others, they uh, have this other prediction market where the participants enter sequentially. And uh, they are paid according to a scoring rule. And this was presented in Tuesday's tutorial. And there is a market maker which decides everything. And then uh, Amos Torkey uh, and his group, they have these machine learning markets uh, where the participants, uh, they bet in such a way to maximize a utility function. And uh, the equilibrium price is computed by optimization. And he has a paper in this ICML about this. So then you see how our market relates to to these markets. Um, so I think it's mo most similar to the uh, m machine learning markets. Um, OK, so we, the, the market price, we define it as a vector of uh, this price for contracts for the different outcomes. And we enforce this condition that the sum of the prices is 1. And exactly like in the Iowa electronic market, the, the contract sells at the market price, which we'll see how we derive, and pays one if the outcome is realized. And the market participants are not human, they are classifiers. And the, cl the classifier is put into the market through this betting function. And I'll show you some betting functions in a moment. So a betting function basically tells you everything you need to know about this Participant. So it tells you how much he will bet for this instance for on each class for each price, any combination of price. So this is 0, 1 to the k. This is 0, 1 to the k for any price. It will tell you this uh, number in 0, 1 to the k, which is 
in, in our setup, the percentage of the budget that will be bet uh, by the participant uh, onto all these classes. So the sum of the phi i's has to be uh, less equal to one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the input? But there's also input zero one to the k. Yeah, the zero one is the price. So for each possible price combination, the price over all the the contracts. That's the input. I so. see. So so the output there is the is the percentage of the budget, but it actually isn't a function of the price. It's just percentage of the budget. The but it's it's a function. Of, it's, it's this. So this is the percentage as a function of the instance and the price. And so I will see that actually in this equation that we're going to get, the, the C appears on both sides of the equation. And on one side is inside all these functions. So that makes it complicated. And then each participant has a budget, um, which tells you how good he was in the past in predicting the correct class. And at the beginning, we initialize everybody with the same budget, and then the budget, some will go up, some will go down. And this is the simplest betting function, the constant betting function. We thought it's ridiculous, but actually it's very easy to use, and it works pretty well for our purpose. Um, so basically, this constant betting function bets according to the classifier probability. So in this example, the classifier probability for this instance is 0 0.8 for one class and 0 0.2 for the other class. So the, the betting function is 0 0.8 on that class and 0 0.2 on the other class, always, no matter what the price is. And this is shown it's for a two-class problem where you pre represent the one probability of one of the classes on the x-axis, okay? And the other one, probability for the other class I mean, the price for the other class is 1 minus it. And then we have the linear betting function, which has the, the probability inside, but multiplied by 1 minus the price. So we thought about this as uh, if, if the price is 1, then you don't want to bet, right? So if, you, if you, the price for a... Uh, uh, one of these outcomes is one, doesn't make sense to bet because you can only lose. If you don't predict the correct class, you lose. And if you do, then you win one. So you, maybe you just bet for the fun of it. Yeah. What are these different curves? What are the different, I see blue, red, and dotted. Yeah, blue is for one, uh, the, the, pre the, um, the betting function for one class, and red is for the other class, and dotted is the sum of them which is the total bet. And the price, so let's say for this one, the price, this price on the x-axis corresponds to the blue line. Okay, so for probability for the blue line is on the x, uh, the h for the blue line is uh, 0 0.2. But, so in that plot, so the x-axis is the price of the security, right? It's the price for one of the classes, for the blue class. Oh, specifically for the blue, blue class. Yeah, and the price for the other one is 1 minus it. So basically, the other curve you read it backwards. OK, so this we thought makes sense, but actually, in reality, it doesn't work that well. And then we have this aggressive betting function, which basically either sells or buys everything. So if the 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 contract price is less than the probability of the classifier. He says, buy, 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 because according to my probability, this is worth buying. And if the price is bigger than the probability, it, it sells for that class and buys everything for the other class. What happens if there's multiple <coughs> classes for which the price is less than the probability? Um, uh, we have a, a formula even for that, okay. somehow. I don't remember. Uh, my student did it. Okay. So, so you always buy one contract. You don't buy fractions of contracts. Actually, no. Yeah, in the you you buy fraction. I think you buy 
according to the probability. So instead of buying one, you buy H. Something like that, or yeah, something like that. Uh, so yeah, and this aggressive market, you will see that it works actually as well as the constant market, but it's much harder to solve. So we, we didn't see too much of a benefit of using it. Okay, and then, so we also presented this uh, before. This is the update uh, on the budget. So it's very easy to read. This is the total amount. So beta M is for participant M. This is this sum, sum of beta M phi KM is the total amount bet by this participant on all the classes. So from the budget, you subtract this much because this much he bet, and then he won for each contract purchased for the correct class, which is Y, he won one dollar. So the, how, much, how many contracts did he buy? He buy beta times phi divided by C. So that's how many contracts he bought. So he won this many dollars. So this is the budget update for this participant. And now, uh, based on this budget update, we put the condition that the sum of the, so the sum of the betas after this update should be the same as the sum of the betas before the update. And this should be independent on the y, because any y is theoretically possible. So from there we get this, these conditions that this sum on the left, sum of beta m phi km over all the participants and all the classes is the sum on this on the right, which has one divided by cy, and this is for any of the y. So this gives you L, uh, n, I mean k, capital K equations, but they are related and together, but together with this, the, the uh, sum of the price is equal to one. They, in many cases, they uniquely determine the price. Okay? And um, we proved that if these functions are monotonic, the phi over C, um, yeah, for each class. If they are monotonic, then the price is unique. And then there's a little bit of, a, of another condition that at least one of the participants should bet. Uh, and we, uh, for our betting functions, uh, this condition holds. So the price is unique in our, the price which is not zero and not one. So not, not totally uh, um, degenerate. Okay, and then to solve these price equations, these, we can do it numerically or analytically. And we can do it analytically for the constant market. We'll see that constant market is just linear aggregation, so it's easy to compute the price. And for the two-class linear market, we can do it uh, analytically. And uh, otherwise, we do it numerically, and we have two methods for uh, Solving it numerically, the double bisection method, which is the bisection method applied like twice one inside the other. And in, for the bisection method, we consider this quantity here, we call it n, and we will do a bisection on this n, and for each n, we apply bisec the bisection method to find the C k for each k, because given n, we have an equation which tells you uh, an equation on uh, c k, c y. So that's double bisection method, but that's quite slow. And then uh, my student Nathan Lay, who did actually a lot of this work, um, he came up with this main iteration, which is a fixed point uh, algorithm, so it's it's like the like like the the contraction. Just you, you don't go in the direction of the contraction all the way. You just go a little bit, and it's much faster than the double bisection method. All right, and we proved that the 
constant betting is linear aggregation, so if you have these constant betting functions, and in general, actually, you don't need to have them to be exactly the classifier, you can have other betting functions which are constant, so which don't depend on the price, but in all those cases, the, the price will just be a linear combination of the betting functions. And this linear combination is like in AWS and Random Forest. And we also get from the budget update, we get this update rule for online learning with linear aggregation. And then we tried really hard and we figured out how to make the uh, prediction market do logistic regression. So in, in that case, so your input is the feature vector and then this, if these are the betting functions, so this is for two class. So this five for one class is x minus, x minus is either x or zero depending if x is negative or not. And x plus is either x or zero if it's x is positive or not. So if you use these betting functions, then you get that the, the probability for y equals one, so c one, let's say, is this, which is the uh, logistic regression model, but without a beta zero. But if you put one of the x's to be one, you can get the beta zero. But there is one, one difference from the logistic regression, that the betas are constrained to sum to, to be constant. So uh, that's different from uh, logistic regression. And then you get this update rule, which conserves the, the, the sum of the betas. Uh, actually, these are switched. Yeah, this is, this is our update rule, and this is the logistic regression update rule. And if you look at them, uh, they are very similar, right? So one of them has this extra x minus beta here, which enforces that the sum of the betas is uh, preserved. And this is a, the betting function for the, an example of a betting function for this logistic regression. So it's, it's interesting. All right. And uh, we also succeeded to, to make uh, the market work with kernels. So in, in this setup, the participants are the instances. So each instance, or you can have a, like a subset of instances if you have too many instances. Each instance is a participant and the, the price is given like this. So based on the instance, the given instance, uh, angle with the input instance. So this is the bet for one class and for the other class. And then we, we, we can prove that the decision boundary is this. The sign sum beta m over the norm of xm. This is just like y to made between minus one and one and xm times x. So because of this, we can kernelize it. So always x appears as a product here and here, as a dot product with the instance. So we can then kernelize it at least with the RBF kernel. So then we can use the RBF kernel and get a nonlinear decision boundary with this market. And here is an example with 1,000 training examples. So given like this on a, on a, on a ring and with the appropriate, actually, yeah, there's no, so yeah. So then from these examples, we get this um, probability of y equals one and the boundary, the decision boundary is shown in this uh, picture. So basically, you get nonlinear decision boundary, but because there is no margin, because we'll see that actually the market uh, is doing maximum likelihood, 
and the SVM is not doing maximum likelihood. Um, there's no mar margin, so the everybody is involved all the time. There are no support vectors, so it can be quite expensive. And <laughs> we proved that the constant market, but in a more general context, that the co just the co the market does not depend the the, the betting functions don't depend on the price. We proved that the the market maximizes this log likelihood, <coughs> which is basically a sum of log of the the correct uh, the price on the correct class. And if we consider this update, which instead of having only one for one instance, has the average from all the instances, this update is an approximation of the gradient ascent on this loss function. And then the, the market update that we use in, in the constant market is actually stochastic gradient ascent. So basically, the constant market minimizes the expected KL between the, the P of Y given X, the true P of Y given X, and the uh, obtained C of Y X. And we also tested this uh, numerically. And this is for two learning rates. And this is like 10 times this one. And we see that it's the, this is the log likelihood, minus log likelihood always goes down very nicely. And this, uh, there are two curves here. One is the, inc the incremental, which is the stochastic version, which is the red one. And the dotted one is the batch version, which works just a little bit worse. And we also did this uh, specialization. Basically, uh, we thought that the, the, these participants, they don't need to bet on all the instances because in, that's what's happening in reality. Maybe some people know something and they decide to bet when they have a good tip, right? So then they can be specialized. Maybe they have a source for those tips. So they know only to bet in some case, maybe when this horse in, enters the, the competition. So then uh, these are specialized classifiers. And our market setup is uh, g general enough that we can combine them no matter how they enter in the, uh, in the betting. And they will have the budgets to maximize the likelihood. And an, one example of specialized classifier that we use in practice are these uh, leaf nodes of random trees in a random forest. So you have a random tree and one leaf node can be viewed as a specialized classifier. If any instance enters its domain, it will bet according to the majority class or to the proportion of the classes. And otherwise, it will not bet. And we use this, uh, these leaves of um, a, a random forest. And we make a market out of them. And we compare with random forest on many UCI data sets. And we test. Uh, with random splits and averaged over 100 runs and test significance with uh, the re results from Breiman because we have two random forest results. We have the results from Breiman and we have our own random forest implementation. And our implementation is a little bit different than Breiman. So uh, if you look here, all these dots represent when the market, our one of these markets is better than our implementation. So you see a lot of dots means usually the market performs better than, significantly better than our random forest implementation. And then the bolds mean that the market performs better than the Breiman based on the uh, mean t-test. And so there are a few bolds. And maybe there is one 
yeah, so it works a little bit better, but uh, it's harder to compare to based on the mean. Okay, uh, then um, with the parity test. All right, and an application because we wanted to compare with AdaBoost, and we have this work done for lymph node detection. So. In this is, uh, you have a CT image, 3D, and you want to detect the lymph nodes, which are very difficult to find. And we have this, uh, this system that first detects a number of lymph node candidates, about 2,000 uh, from this uh, volume, and then at each candidate performs a segmentation of the, of the candidate lymph node, and extracts features based on the segmentation. And those features will be aligned with the boundary of the candidate lymph node, and they are very informative. And a small classifier with about 30 uh, features is selected by AdaBoost. And we have, we have this system, and then we, this, we said, let's take this, okay, so these are some example uh, lymph nodes and candidates. So the, the candidates are all these dots that are just candidates for the center of the lymph node. And then based on the segmentation and the f features, we get like detected lymph nodes like this. And the boxes represent where the true lymph nodes are, and the blue boxes are for other types of lymph nodes that we are not interested in. Um, the AdaBoost classifier is not based on a single threshold, it's based on uh, range, I mean, a number of thresholds which are evenly spaced across the range of the feature. So we call this the histogram classifier. So it looks like this. So either batch one or minus one for each range. And then if we consider each of these bins, it can be made a specialized classifier. So if an instance will fall into this bin, this classifier can bet for one of the classes. So at the beginning, so we make this uh, all these bins, so there are 64 bins for each feature, about 30 features, about 2,048 participants. We make them into a constant market, and we give them the budgets as the coefficients of the, uh, the coefficients of the ADA boost. And then, uh, and we have weights for the examples, for the positives and negatives, because there are many more uh, negatives than positives. Then we train the market, and the, here I showed the detection rate at three false positives per volume, which is a clinically acceptable rate of false positives. So starting, so this, the, the red curve is the test. This is done with six-fold cross-validation. The red curve is the test detection rate, and the black curve is the test market. So the the market goes up, the detection rate, and it goes up by about 1%, maybe a little bit more than 1%. So from a little bit less than 80% to a little bit more than 81%. And then it goes down again. And here is the compared ROC curve between the ADA boost and the market. These are the training curves, and these are the test curves. So the, the market at seven epochs works better for a, a, quite a range of false positives per volume. And the p-value for the comparison is 0 0.044. So it's significant if you, if you wanna be, want it to be significant. And then we have the regression market, which we extend to uncountably many labels. Uh, basically, the, the contracts, there are contracts for different uh, classes, which are any real number, and the winnings are based on a kernel. So we, we consider a reward kernel. So if you're a little bit off, we still give you some money. And then we have this update rule, uh, which is with the integral over the y with the kernel. And then depending on the kernels, we have two betting uh, markets. One is with the delta kernel, which looks exactly like the constant market from uh, classification, and then one with uh, Gaussian kernel, and for to evaluate the integral, we use Gaussian quadrature, 
and we have this approximation of the budget update, numerical approximation. And then here are the examples of the loss. So the loss is always going down because it's doing still maximum likelihood. Uh, and these are the, the test errors. And uh, so this is the loss, this is training error, and this is test error for some examples for uh, regression. And then compare, comparing again with Breiman and with uh, our implementation of random forest, again, we get a lot of dots and no crosses. Oh, we get one cross. So in general, it works better than uh, random forest for regression. And this is an example. With the market, we can do multimodal regression. So maybe the instances for this predictor, they are clustered in two modes, not one. And in regression, we just predict the average, which doesn't make any sense. And with the market, we can predict all these modes, but we need to have some participants that are specialized the right way. And these are an example of participants that we thought of, which is, so for, which is a regression tree. So for each leaf, we have a clustering on the Y. So this is like, imagine X is the predictor and Y is the the Y that you want to predict. So it can have like, like this on a, on a spiral data. So then we can, with the market, we, we combine such trees and we get better uh, results. So in conclusion, we presented the theory for the uh, artificial prediction market, which is based on the Iowa electronic market. And we can aggregate classifiers, regressors, and even densities. We have simple update rules. We showed that we can re simulate logistic regression in kernel methods, and it can be used for online and offline learning. And it significantly outperforms random forest and ADA boost uh, in both prediction and probability estimation. And in, some, in future work, we would like to uh, figure out the generalization error and the VC dimension of the market. Uh, we want to perform participant selection, so like feature selection, to get rid of some participants which are not that good. Um, we'd like to learn the betting functions. So far, we just put them by hand. And then uh, applications of the regression market to computer vision and medical imaging, and maybe other types of market participants than the leaf nodes of random trees. OK, so do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So other uh, questions people have? Yeah. Jennifer? Um, so I really, I like the idea of interpreting this learning algorithm as a market, but I'm having trouble wrapping my head around how to interpret these betting functions. Mm -hmm. they, just, they seem a little odd. And I was wondering, are there actual you know, models of trader utility that would lead traders to use these betting functions? Or how do you interpret these betting functions? Uh, actually, I discussed with Amos about this, and at least the log utility gives you the, the constant betting function. And then he has another utility, the isoelastic, which gives you another betting function that we didn't think of. And by it, it basically, I think, it kind of is still a betting function. Searching more generally, all the because the betting functions are effectively a proportion of wealth. Um, any Hara or isoelastic utility um, falls in that category. So basically, it's a class of utility functions which will lead to betting functions of that particular form. Um, but there are more general utilities where, if you get more wealth, you will change how you bet uh, and very clearly. So, so yeah, so the same one, it was basically the same question, but uh, for the particular, you basically showed you could come up with a betting function that corresponded to logistic regression. 
and that one in particular seemed very opaque to me. I, I was wondering, yeah, basically what she said, if there's any utility that that corresponds to, or if there's any intuition for what that means kind of economically in terms of better behavior. Uh -huh. Yeah, so actually I didn't know anything about utility until like this week. So I don't know what uh, the connection is. So um, in the regression case, you introduce a kernel. Yeah. I was curious why you introduced a kernel. I mean, there's enough degree of freedom for the betters to sort of have the kernel built into the betting function. Uh, yeah, so but we, we just thought, OK, because we are in the classification, you penalize if you didn't get it right. But in regression, you don't penalize if, if, if you not. I mean, you penalize differently in regression. You say, how, how wrong did you get it? How far away are you from the truth? So right, but you could also just, I mean, if you wanted to predict 0.5 and have some error, you could buy all the contracts and some density around it. Yeah, but so actually that's what we saw, that even the, with the delta kernel, which basically says you, if you got it wrong, you're, and you, if you have these uh, smooth uh, betting functions, then we, it, it works. So we don't, we don't necessarily need to have the kernel, but we tried both, and sometimes one works better, and sometimes the other. So I have a question. There were lots of, you showed lots of results where your markets were performing better than some standard systems at Adaboost and, and Renner Forests. And, and yet, at the beginning, what you said, and, and a lot of those you're using constant betting functions, and you're saying constant betting functions basically matches linear combination. Yeah. Um, so I guess one question is, what's producing the win? Because you could go away and implement linear combination fairly, you, know, you just do it, uh, and presumably that's what you do. Um, uh, and people have been using linear combination for some while. So I'm wondering what you feel it is that gives you the win in mm -hmm. practical situations that you've been seeing compared with uh, other situations where people linearly combine things. Yeah, so you can linearly combine things, but then you need to also train. So how do you train? So even, let's say, even if you take the ADA boost, right? So you have a bunch of features, and you train ADA boost, and it's greedy. So it, in these steps, he selected some features, but it never went back to, to combine those features in the best way to give you the best to okay, optimize so the... If you've got a mixture, you could just do a mixture model updates, for example. Um, so you could update the, the weight. So how does your methods compare with, with just optimizing the, uh, the linear combination? Uh, and, and are you talking just a regular measure or like a mixture of experts? Well, um, I'm saying you have a linear combination with a set of weights, and that linear combination defines a yeah, but it's, it's not a linear, regular linear combination because we have the specialization also. So because of that, in, on different instances, different combinations are combined and divided by. So that's not, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.